this video is for anyone, especially students, that want to understand the recruiting process better. Maybe recruiting out of college seems super daunting to you. Maybe it feels like everyone else got the memo and you missed the boat on something and that's making you feel anxious. This video is going to help with that. Now, we naturally fear the unknown and by keeping the recruiting process unknown, employers actually have more negotiating leverage over you. I want you to have more negotiating leverage. I want you to feel less than less anxious than I did when I was recruiting. So today I want to talk about how the investment banking recruiting process actually works. Welcome back to my channel. My name is Peter Kang. I'm an ex investment banker, ex corporate Hollywood guy. I worked at Hulu. I did startups as well. And now I'm making content, sharing what I've learned along the way with you. Thanks for tuning in. I remember people telling me to believe in myself, to have a positive attitude, and that is true and that does help, but systematically understanding the, the challenge and the game that's laid out in front of you is so much more helpful. If recruiting is a black box to you, it's almost inevitable that you're going to be blindly, anxiously kind of going through the motions and doing things that may not be effective, but more so you just see other people doing them. The three coffee chats that you went on this week might not really matter, might be a waste of time if you don't know how it fits exactly into the puzzle. The three hours that you spent at a networking event asking that banker questions might not matter if you don't know how it fits into the puzzles. This video is going to apply directly to you if you are going to a target school and thinking about pursuing a career in high finance, high finance. <laughs> Even if you're not at a target, it'll reveal to you exactly why it's so hard and frustrating to try and get into a bulge bracket or elite boutique from a non-target so you can uh, appropriately strategize and calibrate. Even if you're not interested in going into finance, a lot of top tier companies do think about hiring out of college this way. So I do think you'll get value out of this video. Stick around. Let's break it down. In true banker fashion, I'm going to diagram this out in PowerPoint for you. I'm going to start super zoomed out from the bank's perspective and then get down to your perspective, the recruitee, the candidate's perspective. Stick with me. Okay. First thing you need to understand is that companies, banks included, decide how much money that they budget and plan to spend in the next year at the beginning of the year. Uh, and that uh, that includes headcount, right? So the budget and headcount are set at the beginning of the year by these banks. And what are they based on? They're based on expected churn and growth. So the amount of money they set aside for new hires, their salary, and the money it takes to acquire them and the number of people that they're gonna hire is already set at the beginning of the year. And it's set based on how many people that they think are leaving. Let's say the bank needs 100 analysts at any given time to function properly. And then 60 of them said, hey, we're gonna leave. Next year, you're gonna plan to hire 60 people. That, that's how they budget, that's how they plan. And then those 100, let's say, let's say instead of 60, you need to hire 100 more people the next year. That 100 number is then allocated to each target school. Let's say each, each target school. Based on the influence of the alumni from each target school at the bank, uh, the performance and feedback of the analysts recruited from each target school, and churn rates. So let's say Stern kids do really well at this bank, but they keep quitting after eight months, then the bank might decrease the allocation that they give towards Stern students because they also care about people not quitting so fast, right? So if we diagram this out, it'll look something like this. This is a diagram for one bank, okay? Um, and the bank is gonna have a bunch of different divisions. It's gonna have, you know, sales and trading, maybe retail, or maybe, or maybe wealth management, you know, um, let's say IBD, etc. Okay. And then we can uh, X these out and put these under IBD. And then this within IBD, uh, that hundred analysts that we need for investment banking division to hire for the next year is going to be then allocated based on school. So maybe the target schools for this school might be Harvard and Wharton and, you know, NYU Stern, because that's where I went. And then uh, just for example, and then et cetera, there's, there's tons more, there's tons more, but let's just say, et cetera. And then within this scope, maybe uh, there's like a hundred analysts, like we said, and then we allocate that 
Uh, maybe Harvard has, you know, five allocated this year. Maybe Wharton is super influential and kills it at this bank, so they have 15. Let's say Stern is allocated 10 heads, and then et cetera is all the rest. Within NYU Stern and within each of the schools, there's a recruiting team. And the leaders of that recruiting team, they're going to be the senior leads, and they're generally going to be like, I don't know, a few, like let's say like two MDs, partners, global heads, chairs, things like that. And then there's going to be a team captain that acts more like a quarterback, like actual operations of and like logistics of this recruiting team. Um, <laughs> that says caption, capitan, cap, captain, cap, captain. Okay, cool. Attention to detail. And then there's going to be the actual team members. Okay, and these are going to be, you know, handful of recent grads. So, I, I don't know. It depends on how big your presence is at that school, but it's going to be anywhere from like 2 to 5 to 10 or whatever. This is the hierarchy of who decides how many people get hired from each school. At the bank level, at the high bank level, it's already decided that only 100 are going to be hired in the on-cycle recruiting process. And then at the HR level, they allocate that 100 to Harvard, to Columbia, to Wharton, Stern, whatever, the, these 10, right? And then within that, within, those, within that 10 slot, these people then decide who to give offers to to try and fill that 10 spot then fill those 10 slots. Now, what you might notice here is that there is no node, there is no allocation for non-target schools. This is why that if you're at a non-target school, it might not really make sense to, you know, gun for bulge brackets. You're just not explicitly part of the way that they recruit. So if you're from a non-target school, what's your way in? It's when this budget and actuals don't line up. So you wanted to hire, so the bank planned to hire 100 analysts because you need 200 and 100 said they're leaving. But then in actuality, 120 left. That's when you go and hire 20 laterals from other banks, whether it be other bulge brackets or small sell side shops. That's why if you're non-target, I say, you know, it might make sense to go to a small sell side shop and then be there for a year, two years, six months. So many people are churning out from these bulge brackets that you can fathomably uh, lateral into a bulge relatively soon and in the grand scheme of things a year or two to lateral into a bulge of your you know 10 50 10 20 year career is is not that not that big of a deal okay so this is illustrative for one bank now that we've uh clarified that we can move on to understanding the recruiting funnel what is a recruiting funnel this is what i like to call how we get from a thousand plus like thousands of applicants that submit their resume online to the bank to this to this uh these these 10 offer acceptees these 10 uh people that get hired for the internship okay this is going to be um illustrative this is going to be illustrative for one let's say bulge bracket uh for one school I don't know, around like as of 2016. Why do I cl clarify that? Because this this changes a little bit every year, um, especially the timing. The timing is going to be pretty off because every year uh, it gets a little bit earlier and earlier. And I actually don't know wh where the the active recruiting starts. And that's kind of up to you to recruit, and, or that's kind of up to you to network with upperclassmen to get a sense of timing there. But this framework should largely still apply. So what does this funnel mean? Just understand that at the top is like total applicants. At the bottom is going to be this 10, this 10, this uh, 10 offers accepted. Okay. So it's like, it's a funnel. It's like a thousand goes in and then it gets filtered down into just a, a handful. So there's an arrow for you to understand directionally. <laughs> <laughs> what's what's happening here okay so remember that it, it goes like this it, it's a funnel um, so total applicants the next rung is going to be serious contenders contendors contenders and I'll go over what separates the applicants from people that are actually 
considered even by the bank. Um, series contenders. The next rung is going to be first round interviews. These are going to be on campus. This is going to be super days. Next round. Super days are just another name for like the four hour, six hour interviews that are done on site at the company. Like one interview back to back after the other. Um, ignore. Um, and then the, the next rung is going to be offers given and then offers accepted, right? Because not everyone's going to accept the offer because they have multiple offers and they're going to, you know, go to one and not multiple banks. So offers given offers accepted. And then let's go through the numbers, but let's go, let's go reverse. Let's go backwards here. So offers accepted is going to be 10, right? Because that's what the bank is targeting. They want to hire 10 people and they can find 10 people because there's a lot of supply of people that are qualified that want to be investment bankers. Oh, and let's clarify that this is also for uh, for junior junior summer internships, because um, generally the full time roles are like ninety plus percent filled by junior interns that accept the return offer. Offers accepted ten, but I will say like again these are fake numbers, but let's say like eight are going to be from this process and two are going to be from diversity diversity programs from like sophomore year or something. It might be like a woman's program it might be an lgbtq program a veterans program or something but let's just say some of that 10 is is going to be filled with diversity programs that doesn't mean that this eight is going to be just straight white straight asian males uh they th this that like diversity is also factored in for this eight but they ha a lot of banks have specific programs around uh diversity programs that are done and over with before this junior recruiting process even happens. So let's say really we we need eight uh, accepted offers from this funnel. This two is kind of coming in from the from a, a different funnel. So in order to get get eight people that accept offers, the bank is gonna uh, give about like it's gonna give about eight offers and like around like four people on the wait list. Okay, and they're gonna be ranked. And this is done because, uh, you know, people might get an offer from multiple banks and then you say no to all of them except one. This bank might give eight people offers, two of them say no, and then you go to your wait list and then you give the top two of them the offer. Super days to give, you know, these combined 12 offers, pseudo offers, uh, there's going to be like, like maybe like 20 candidates. Okay, you're going to you're going to have 20 people do final rounds and then out of that 20 you're going to give these 12. So for 20 candidates uh for super days, maybe you have like 40 first round candidates. Okay, I'm just using real round numbers for ease. It's directional. And then serious contenders for one school, for one bank, maybe maybe there's like 100. And then total applicants is is it's almost doesn't matter but uh let's just say there's like thousands okay it just the fact that there's a ton here and then a lot less is are even considered okay that's what's important here now you understand the funnel and the different rungs of the filters that happen within the recruiting process this is how you get from total applicants in the thousands to just the 10 offers accepted for this school for one bank okay I'm going to work my way backwards and start from down here offers accepted and explain to you uh, the timeline and the key decision makers at each filter. Okay. And I'm also going to show you the conversion rates, but you know, that's just math. By the time these offers are accepted and locked in for me, that was the end of junior fall semester for the junior leading into senior year, summer internship. Okay. This is likely, this has gotten earlier and earlier every year. So I don't know how much earlier this is happening at this point. This framework still works. Just that, just know that this timeline might be shifted forward and condensed even more now. And that is a matter of you networking with your upperclassmen to figure it out. I'm just going to give you illustratively my timeline. Okay. Junior fall is when these offers are accepted. And then from going from offers given to offers accepted, that's going to be like, what, like illustratively like 80% you know, conversion, 80% of people that are given offers accept the offers. And then um, the candidates in that position obviously have the most leverage for the first time versus, it's not that they have more leverage than the banks per se, but they have more leverage than the decision makers. And that happens in less than a week. 
this is where you hear about exploding offers where the banks give you an offer and you have to accept before like the next Friday or the offer explodes, blah, blah, blah. It's because they've spent six months searching for the right candidates. They've invested a lot into this process. So it's very costly if uh, a bunch of people don't accept their offers because all the other good talent in that grade and locked up with other banks. So that's why it's uh, very important for them to lock good talent in as soon as possible. That's why they give you less than a week. And since they, since this is the time where you have most leverage, more leverage than ever, this is when I encourage candidates to ask the harder hitting questions. I know you're tired, but do another round of due diligence and like do another round of coffee chats, asking more hard hitting questions. Now working our way up the rungs, going from 20 super days to about 10 offers, that's going to be 50%, right? And here the senior leads, these guys, these MDs that run the super days, obviously have the most say. They're the ones that run the interviews and then filter and pick the candidates that they like the most to give the offers out to. Between taking the super day to the offers given, that's going to be around a week as well. Um, they try to get that, again, turned around super quick because they know that they're rushing to lock in uh, candidates before the other banks do. So that's going to be around a week. Let's keep working our way up. We're going from 40 first round interview candidates to about 20 super days. That's going to be 50% again. Here, the team captain and other people in like the mid, like VP director level uh, interviewers that are part of the school's recruiting team, they're going to have the most say because they're going to be the ones that actually run the first round interviews, right? And between the first round and the second round, that's going to be around a week as well. Another straightforward wrong. Let's keep going. From serious contenders to first round interviews we have about let's say 40 percent filter and then here is where the first and second years have the most influence and this happens within about one semester uh and this is when recruiting season is this is what people recruit people refer to as you know on campus recruiting uh this is this is on cycle recruiting this is the recruiting season okay this is kind of where I would say this rung and the rung above it is where students feel the most confused and, and have the least amount of info about because they really don't understand what goes on here, right? Down here, it's it's pretty it's pretty transparent. You just do the interview and whether you do well in the interview or not, you get to the next round. So how do you go from serious contenders to first round interview candidates? That's where the coffee chats come in. Really what you do is you get coffee chats by either directly knowing these first years and second years or through referrals of mentors you know, friends through campus, things like that. You get coffee with them. You ask them questions about the firm. It's one, On the one hand, you're investigating how do I signal to them that I'm a good candidate and fit for their company. But on the other hand, you're selling them. You're talking about your previous experiences, your internships, uh, that you can talk with confidence and, and, and a degree of authority on why finance, what banking is, that you know your technicals, all those things. You're ba they're basically pre-filtering you to see if you are someone that they would vouch for to put you in the first round interviews. These first and second years with a team captain, they, they sit down, they take these hundred-ish resumes and they deliberate, almost like a frat. They deliberate, they, they talk about like, Hey, which 40 should we pick? Within that 40 is going to be a mix of, you know, diversity considerations, uh, who these first and second years know the best to be well equipped and well prepared. Let's go one more rung up. Okay. Here is total applicants, which is like anyone and everyone that submits a resume online. And the conversion rate is not meaningful because it's not even a real filter. Like th these people aren't really considered. I just wanted to make it a rung to show you that um, there's a break in the system here. Here is where you have uh, the upperclassmen and first years having the most influence. And this arguably starts from day one of your freshman year through the launch of through the launch of the recruiting season. The way you become a serious contender is through your reputation that you build throughout those years. Have you been involved on campus? Do people know that you're easy to work with? Do people know that you are hardworking? Have you been getting finance related internships? Have you been involved with investing clubs, finance clubs? And that's super important because, because the upperclassmen simply can't get to know a thousand total applicants. So, so the people that they know from their clubs, 
that they've spent hours and hours with and understand the character of, understand the intellect and personality and drive of are much easier to uh, recommend. And there's just so much de- supply of candidates that you really only select from these 100 serious contenders. These 100 serious contenders, like they, everyone kind of knows who they are because uh, they're involved on campus. They've had past internships. They're contributing to the clubs on campus that know what they're doing and, and, and feed into these banks. If you're, if you're at early stages of college, then yeah, you should, you should get in here if you want. Um, you don't have to if you're not interested in this process, but to set yourself up for success, being involved in campus, um, being hardworking, being generally well-liked, and, and being known for being easy to work with, those are all great things that get you into this rung. But that's happening uh, in the background through the whole time that you are a student, which is why people, I think, are confused when it comes to junior year and then they want to start recruiting, right? And then they want to be like, okay, what do I need to do? It's already been happening since like freshman year. So, okay, this is a lot of, this is a lot of stuff on a page. Let's take a step back. The last thing that I want to point out about these diagrams is to use it as a rubric to where you should spend your time based on where you are in this timeline different people are going to be the key drivers and decision makers. If it's freshman year, right? That's this wrong, right? If it's freshman year and it's this wrong, meeting with MDs at a company, they're not really going to be able to directly give you anything, right? Because that's not their key ability to give you value. Doesn't happen until junior or like doesn't happen until way later when it's this part of the funnel. If you talk to an upperclassman from Harvard, right, they can't really directly help you because their process is separated away. Like they're not going to give you one of these five seats, right? If you're an NYU student, because that it's already allocated to them at five. If you talk to an MD in S and T, they can't really directly help you unless they love you so much that they talk to a friend, they find a friend in the IBD uh, division that happens to be in your you know, school recruiting team. And then they have to wait until you get through this entire funnel to you know, give you the offer. If you talk to an MD that is your school alum, a lot of times this happens and they might you know, put you in touch with an upperclassman uh, or a first year, second year within the firm. But if it's not the right part of the timeline, then they might not be able to help you right away. Now, if you keep in touch with them and build rapport with them, that will help you once you become a junior and you're recruiting. Make sure you're spending time with people that actually have the ability to influence and and uh, help you throughout this hierarchy and this timeline because they're going to be the ones that actually can help you. Otherwise, you might be wasting your time and their time. Uh, I'm not saying don't do it at all. Just know what you're doing. If you think you can talk to a Harvard wealth management MD, but still somehow leapfrog into one of these orange decision makers at the right timeline, then yeah, that might be your way in. But if you're, if if you're just kind of blindly picking and choosing someone at the bank, they're just not able to necessarily help you because the number of headcount per school per year is already set. And that's going to be taken up by this official recruiting committee that picks 40 out of 100 out of thousands. Whew, I covered a lot here. So I hope all of this was helpful to you as you think about using your time more effectively and stressing less as you recruit through any process. If you thought this was interesting or if this was valuable to you, please leave a like and consider subscribing. I will see you in one of my next videos. Thanks.